Today on CityCast Portland, we're talking ghost kitchens, the decrease in commuter bicycling, and the Portland Art Museum's PR disaster. Crystal Ligori, one of the hosts of All Things Considered at Oregon Public Broadcasting and a former colleague, will be joining us for our weekly news roundup, as well as our very own lead producer, John Otariani. It's Friday, March 24th. I'm Claudia Meza, and this is what Portland's talking about. Crystal, John, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having us. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I think this might be a mini reunion of sorts. It is. The old OPB team back together. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking we've all sang karaoke together, I think. That is true. Well, so, uh, Crystal, normally uh, we always start off this Friday roundup with a question just so the listener knows who's in the room. Do you guys know like a really super random, maybe weird fun fact, you know, like that only you might know, (laughs) you know, something that you're just like, not enough people know this, but I know this. Um, And before, and if I'll go first, just, just because I asked, and that usually gives people a chance to, you know, gather their thoughts. But um, did you know that the really popular lawn game cornhole or beanbag toss has many regional nicknames Uh, to name a few. It also goes by Bago, dummy boards, and my personal fave, which is the only reason I'm bringing this up, dad hole no all one word dad <laughs> hole yeah i'm i'm xing that i don't <laughs> dad hole is very evocative of what of what cornhole is yeah think about that next time you're drunkenly trying to get those bags in the dad hole <laughs> no i uh, don't want to <laughs> <laughs> um okay so my fun fact i feel like a lot of people don't realize that coffee beans are not beans they're the pit of a of a cherry and so when coffee's harvested, it's actually cherry form. And then that is often peeled off or let to dry on the cherry before it's ever processed, which I think is a really interesting thing that, you know, almost two thirds of folks drink coffee every single day in the U.S. And yeah, we don't really know where it comes from. I feel like I like kind of casually knew that coffee is a fruit, but I hadn't really wrapped my head around it. They're like, no, there is like a fruit (laughs) on top of the bean. That's really cool. Yeah. So what about you, John? What's your uh, fun fact? Uh, What came to mind is that there used to be competitive art in the Olympics. What? Like like back in the 20s and 30s, there was like also competitions for like Olympic painting and like Olympic sculpture. So there was like the athletics portion of it. And then there was the part of it that like was kind of like a like juried like art exhibition. And you could get like an Olympic sculpting medal. Um, When did that stop? I think it was like the 40s. They were like, this is silly. We should stick with the athletics. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, my opinion. <laughs> you know what that reminds me of is that, you know, uh, in high school, you could get like a letterman jacket if you like lettered in your sport or whatever. Exactly. They offered yeah. it for speech and debate, which I was yeah. on. And so like you could get like an I academic was... letter jacket. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So I had like the letter. So, so you're a varsity speaker. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think you need to put this on your professional bio, Crystal. <laughs> I might. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't like you could talk the fastest. Like, oh, Crystal, she's just... Rah, I wish. <laughs> like the Micro Machines guy? Yeah. That's a dream. So usually the way it works, Crystal, is we have our guests go first. Uh, so let, let us know which headline caught your attention this week. So something that I was focused on uh, when I saw it, pop up in my feeds is the sort of latest saga in the ghost kitchen snafu that's happening here in Portland. It was um, written by Sophie Peel, who I know you had on your news roundtable just recently. And the latest news is that the Miami ghost kitchen company called Reef Technology is actually closing all of its locations in Portland. And it, they came into the city in 2019-ish, but really huge popularity expansion during the pandemic, of course, when everyone was at home ordering virtually. And I think it's just a really interesting conversation because even though these 25 or so vessels, which um, is what uh, they're being called, are now closed down, there's still lots of ghost kitchens that are in brick and mortar spaces. And I think for me, it's really making me think about how I access food and Mm -hmm. the importance of, you know, is, is it important 
that I know who's making my food or I know that there's a chef or I know that there's a restaurant space. Is that important? So interesting to think about like how so much of the 20th century was sort of about like turning food into brands. You know Mm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, like for up until basically before the pandemic, like it was all about, you know exactly what you're going to get because it is a brand. It is a chain. The food is the same everywhere. You kind of identify with like the design aesthetic of the restaurant as much as the food itself. And ghost kitchens are Mm -hmm. kind of like the complete opposite of that, right? But they're still selling you a brand. That's a thing. That's what's so crazy. You think it's, that's why Crystal thought it was a restaurant because like, they're like, oh, yummy burgers. And you're like, oh, I've not heard of this restaurant in town. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Right. I, I mean, Red Robin had done something where I think they had four different sort of shadow brands, I guess. And Mm -hmm. so they were on food apps that uh, as four different locations and maybe the mix of ingredients was different or the recipes were different, but it was all the same thing. I mean, but brick and mortars are doing this too. So I live in St. John's and there's this pizza place called La Verona, um, Mm -hmm. which is like just like a great like neighborhood pizza place. But then they also have pizza like rock and roll pizza. Hmm which is the exact same restaurant. (laughs) It's just two different brands online under two names online. And if you go in, they have two menus up above the counter. (laughs) And it's the same menu. It's like the same food. They just have like... Why? I want to know why. That just seems like so much more work. I mean, it's like... Is it a wider net? A wider brand net? I think it's like SEO optimization. You know what I mean? It's like when someone's scrolling through an app and they decide to click on something. Yeah. But in real life. So you guys, here's the thing about the reef kitchens is that I don't know if you knew this, but um, it and I didn't I didn't know this until I read that same article, Crystal, Mm -hmm. that it came in and it was trying to sell its whole deal to the city as it's going to be this utopic uh, experience. Like, hey, we're going to take these empty lots. We're going to put all of our, you know, um, trailers out here with all our fake brands. But We're also going to just bring in like places for people to buy groceries. They were just like, we're going to be like these little life pods where Mm. we're going to make this neighborhood more walkable and more livable. And so I think the city gave them deals because they're just like, well, that sounds great. But it never freaking happened. And Mm -hmm. instead, they just kept getting one after another ding from the Omaha County just being like, hey, can you do something about the rats? Um, (laughs) Hey, can you do something about the uh, garbage? Can you do something? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, can you actually just pay your rent? Um, mm-hmm. You know, and it just kept <laughs> snowballing. And I have to say, I, I've only tried their food once because I was bamboozled by thinking that it was, um, I think it was like, remember that one? It was during the pandemic where we thought David uh-huh. Chang brought food. Yes. yes. Fuku, I was going to yes. say, the, the yes. first time that I became really aware of ghost kitchens, that it was really that? dawned on me, was your, no, specifically, Claudia, you your rant about yes. the chicken sandwich. <laughs> Oh, did I rant? <laughs> you ranted. I I'm think like, you wait. sent it. I don't know if it was on a public thing or you sent it to John and I, but we were all talking about this. You oh my know, God. Did I do brand. an all OPB? Did I do an all OPB <laughs> rant? Where I was like, you You're guys. Like, at all staff. I, I at all staff my rant. Oh my. It was, guys, it was the pandemic. I was like, you know what? Wash your hands and also don't order Fuku. It's not real. <laughs> it it's was not the real. worst chicken sandwich. It was the worst chicken sandwich. To their benefit, they gave me my money back. I think they heard about the rant. (laughs) (laughs) To go back to the micro communities thing that you brought up, which is, I mean, that would be so amazing and would be so smart, especially we're talking about having these locations in parts of Portland that maybe aren't super walkable, that don't have a lot of access to fresh foods. I mean, I live, you know, deep, deep Southeast and the... Walmart is closing, which sounds like, who cares? Walmart's closing, Mm -hmm. but it's one of Mm -hmm. the only places that's walking distance that you can get groceries Mm -hmm. in that area. So it's 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 hard when you talk about these food deserts and accessing any sort of food and making these little communities. It seems like an incredible idea. And the fact that they did a little bait and switch, it feels like. It's no wonder it didn't work out. Mm. Yeah. Well, we're going to move on here. John, what's your headline of of the week? Yeah, I've been thinking about the worst day of the year bike ride. Mm -hmm. Uh, So the worst day of the year bike ride happened 
this past Sunday. It's an annual event in Portland. So it is sort of like this celebration of the end of winter. But it came right after this really, really gorgeous Saturday that we had <laughs> last weekend. And, and I feel like even this week, there's been a couple days where it's like, oh, my God, spring is here. So I've been trying to think about when the worst day of the year in Portland might actually be. Like as opposed to trying to do it right at the end of spring uh, mm. or right at the end of winter, you know, like like this the event. actual you, date date, like 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 the time of year, like the era of uh, like in Portland of when the worst day is February. It's always February. I think like February is the, the month. I, I, OK, OK, here we go. So like I think February is like the emotional like we feel it in February. But but the the coldest month is usually January and the wettest months are November and December. And also December has the shortest day, right? Like we have the winter solstice in mm. December. So I sort of wanted to put it out there for discussion of like when you think that like the actual worst day of the year is. I feel like it's got to be sometime in January only because I feel like February, there's the February fake out, right? Isn't there always some like 70 degree day in the middle of February that's like gorgeous and people are in tank tops and sitting out drinking beers on patios? That doesn't mm -hmm. that's not a January fake out. That's kind of a February specific thing. And so I think that January is sort of just no thanks, you know, and it's post holiday. Mm -hmm. So it also feels like there's nothing to look forward to. So yeah, I'd say you've like, gotten over a bunch of time off and mm -hmm. you're just sort of like, well, now it's raining and I guess I'm working forever. Oh, my God. It's the opposite yeah. for me. I'm just like, yay, holiday's over. God bless January. <laughs> and then February comes in and I'm like, still more, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and by March, I'm seeing the little buds, even if we do get major fake outs, which we always do in March. I mean, I think last year it snowed in May. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was that May? Oh, yeah. yeah. It was May. Yeah. And we're just like, mm -hmm. why? <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, my eight, like my heat had been off for like a whole month. And then I had to bring it back for like a weekend. And it just yeah. made no sense. Um, but yeah, I stand by my, I stand my ground on February. Come yes. at me every other month. Okay. I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to go like real hard on like two outside ideas. I'm going to pick two months. One, I actually pick November. Okay? okay. And here's why I say November is I feel like we like go through fall and it's like nice out and it's crisp. And then the rain hits and that adjustment is like so extreme. I feel like by the time that we get into like February, March, I've sort of like settled into my winter groove. Mm -hmm. But I feel like when November hits and it just sort of like hits me really hard. And I'm mm -hmm. like, the you transition. Know, I lo you lose yeah. your like outdoor routine and you're like, well, what do I do now? Like, I guess mm. I'm just like stuck inside and I haven't built any habits. So November is my second worst, my actual worst, my actual worst month, September. No. No. What? It's beautiful. Because John, here, here's John why. you're wrong. Here's why. September <laughs> is We vetoed this season. option. September is smoke season. And I feel like no matter how bad winter in portland gets the like the month that we have of smoky weather is like way always way harder and like way worse and way more wrenching than like but i feel like that is rain. as of late i don't think that was always the september deal you know it's i know that's what i'm saying is the future is september is the worst no <laughs> still just like no <laughs> you know what though uh i actually you've won me over i feel like the worst day of the year bike ride should move to november for the exact things you said because i feel like exactly. it would be more of a rallying cry like here comes the shit we are mm -hmm. riding through it and i feel <laughs> yeah. i hope that the i hope that whoever organizes this that bike ride if they're listening go for it because more and more march is going to gonna get nicer because yeah. of global warming climate so you're going to have right. to move yeah yeah because of climate change so you're going to have to move it up and i feel like john just pitched you the perfect month to do so i will say though that i'm going to be a lot less likely to do that bike ride in november than i am in march <laughs> i feel like by right. the time march comes around i'm like i will do anything to be outside whereas in november <laughs> i'm just like Okay, I'm watching movies. I can't believe you're <laughs> ruining your own pitch, John. I'm never bringing you into a room with the uh, clients. 
Or we don't do it. <laughs> what if we just don't get out of here? We had them. At least I'm not pitching September. At least I'm not pitching the no, annual No, you did smoke. pitch September. We no, immediately no, no, no. shut I'm it not, down. I'm not, a, uh, I'm not pitching an annual smoke ride in September. Oh, gotcha. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everyone with respirators and yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but the one thing, like, kind of on the serious side, I do want to like tie it into though is, you know, they had 850 people come out for the bike ride this year, and and I think it's interesting to think about the worst day of the year bike ride, um, in view of like some stats that have come out from the Portland Bureau of Transportation about how bike riding is kind of tanking in yeah, Portland. It's declining. It's declining. Yeah, yeah. They said that it has dropped like 35 percent between 2019 and 2022. What do you think that could be? Is it um, all the deaths? Well, well, actually, Rachel. That's bleak, but true. Rachel Monahan uh, of the Hey Portland CityCast newsletter just had I've a heard of her. on this. And she talked with um, uh, Jonathan Mouse from Bike Portland. And he sort of says it's two things. One, um, just the pandemic means that people aren't commuting as much. Mm-hmm. So, Ugh. so many people who used to be bike commuters are doing what you and I do, Claudia, and I'm just like working from our home office. So that cut a bunch of, I'm, I'm walking everywhere. So that cut a bunch of uh, butt cycling out. Um, but, they, but he also speculated that it might just be safety concerns that like people are more scared of cars, that cars feel more aggressive towards mm-hmm. cyclists than they used to. Um, and that they just feel like generally Portland streets feel less safe. So like that's what I just not, said. <laughs> that, and, Fold and, me in. Fold and, me and, into your answer. And our friend from Bike Portland agrees with you, Claudia. <laughs> he, he concurs. I do feel like as as a like fair weather bicyclist and someone who is new to you know regularly biking, I feel uncomfortable biking on a lot of Portland streets. Mm-hmm. The commuting aspect for me feels too fraught. <laughs> um. Cool. Well, let's take a break here. When we come back, more headlines of the week. So my headline is not super. uh, I wanted to talk about the embarrassing fiasco the Portland Art Museum has had to clean up. Because really what I want to talk about is the aftermath of what happened. Mm -hmm. And if Mm -hmm. uh, I think the most people are just like, what is she talking about? Like the, the story most people have heard is that an indigenous woman wearing a traditional woven baby carrier, uh, the kind that's like worn on your back, was hassled or turned away because of a st- of standard museum rules not allowing backpacks or large bags inside exhibits. But, and that already is kind of like, oh, you know, have some cultural understanding. But that's what's not what, what was like the, the like devastating blow was that she she was trying to get into a major Native American exhibition and she, you know. She brought her, it was the first time she was at that museum because she felt welcomed and she had brought family, family visited from Mm -hmm. like not here to go. And, you know, it it was just like so freaking embarrassing. I mean, did you guys all hear something similar? Oh, yeah. I mean, I saw it on my social media feeds first, folks resharing her post on Instagram. And it just felt like what a gut punch, right? Like what Mm -hmm. a terrible Everything about it was terrible. And, you know, when I I saw more coverage on it and got more context, and I I think that in the Instagram post, she had said something about or to the effect of, you know, Pam basically only respects Indigenous folks when they're part of the art on display, essentially. And that, Mm. that kind of stopped me in my tracks and it felt really terrible to see that, especially an institution like that in the art world here in Portland. Mm -hmm. So I want to tell you what actually happened in, in her, in her uh, dealing with, with the, with a museum, because it was a lot more hassle than you could imagine. Hmm. This woman is Dr. Sophia Weinstein, and she is a doctor at OHSU. And this was literally her first day off in like three weeks. So just think about that, like how, much she was carrying already you know Mm -hmm. and then she's hosting her family and she has her baby infant um and so when she goes in she's not the baby isn't in the carrier they're just holding it because it's like a stroller you know and they're like oh you can't come in blah 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 and then you know her family was like well that's this is neither a bag or a backpack and they're just like oh 
okay, that makes sense. You know, proceed. So she got in and she was actually enjoying and like uh, really, you know, experiencing this exhibit, which by the way, everyone should go see. Um, And then out of nowhere, someone from some staff member comes through and basically says, no, 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 you got it. Like you, you can't. And as she was ushered out, um, she wrote, she's like, according to the nice white lady, Leland's baby basket is a danger to the art and also my baby. So like the condescension that goes on, hold on. So her, she's, I know backpacks aren't allowed by museum policy. Cool item though. She says, as we are shown the door. In a Native American exhibit. Yeah, yeah. In in a Native American exhibit. I mean, and for me, what what I thought of is like, you know, this is not an institution that has like a neutral record uh, when it comes to like how it treats non-white communities, right? Like the museums, like uh, art museums have always had this really, really dicey relationship where like a lot of the stuff that they've been putting on display has been like taken from native or indigenous communities. And, uh, you know, like, of course, there's been like a really, really rough relationship between the art and the artifacts that are on display and the cultures that actually created them. And not just this museum, like museums, you know? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. All all museums. All museums. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Because I want to just before I go, I continue like telling you what else happened. Um, uh, I want to just say that this is so embarrassing for uh, the Portland Art Museum because they actually hired a Native American curator in 2020. So like they were really trying to open up their like walls, their institutional walls to different marginalized groups in Portland to say, hey, this is yours too. Mm -hmm. So the fact that one person could ruin all that effort is mm-hmm. to me just like so indicative of what we're experiencing right now in culture, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. so another thing that happened was as she was being pushed out, I mean, I'm sure it wasn't like physically, but just like being told to go. She said something really profound. Uh, this is Dr. Weinstein when she said, I get it. Kill the Indian, save the man was also a policy, which was mm-hmm. a, a, a thing that was said during uh, boarding schools. Mm-hmm. And, This is the best part is that the woman was like, you need to cool down and take a deep breath, which is like, oh, (laughs) that's what the museum staffer said. Yeah. Yeah. After basically telling her that her really cool item was actually probably not appropriate for her child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A a woman, by the way, who comes from a long line of of basket weavers who made that basket before this this baby was born. Who (laughs) is just like who who. Of people who've been carrying their children this way for thousands, probably longer than a stroller. Yeah, yeah. You know, and now people hearing about it in solidarity are like, fuck Pam, I'm not going. And it's like, do you know how hard this curator worked for this? She, so yeah. the um, the curator yeah. that they hired in 2020, her name is Kathleen Ash Milby. And she worked on that exhibit for seven years. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, and I'll, I'll underline that. I actually interviewed her a couple of years ago for the first exhibit that she put on at PAM, um, which was called Mesh, which was um, all contemporary indigenous art of like artists who are working today. Some of them were from the Pacific Northwest. And it was incredible. It was like so one, good. it was one of the best, uh, you know, exhibits of contemporary art that I've seen in Portland, like full stop. Uh, hmm. You know, and, uh, and and I'm and I'm super excited. I haven't made it down to see this oh, exhibition, but I'm super excited, and I have like so much like excitement and like about the work that she is programming. The, the depth that she mm-hmm. adds to like it's a story. You're you're being told a, a story. You're being interweaved in the art, and it, she and what I love is all the connections that she is able to make with uh, the rest of the art world. So it's not isolated because usually this is what happens when you see a person of color's artwork in a museum it is slightly fetishized like oh even in the caribbean with just a crayon look at this you know what rather than just like look at how this was influenced by this and how this work influenced europeans and you know there's an actual like we live in the same ecosystem of creating you know rather Mm -hmm. than like look at this weird goof of like some like genius you know in 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 the southwest who would have known The exhibit is called the Dakota Modern, the Art of Oscar Howe. And it first, before it came to Pam, it was actually in the the Smithsonian National Museum. And I just want to point that, like, the reason I brought this up, aside from, like, 
pointed out even worse things that happened that no one knew about was just like, that is like what is being overshadowed. And I just hope everyone listening mm. goes to the exhibit. Yeah, yeah. You guys picking up what I'm laying down? No, it's <laughs> totally, what comes to I mean, me is like, you know, I think that this is a, something that all sorts of institutions can take away from when like we're thinking about diversity and equity. Like you could have all sorts of like high minded ideas about how even handed and equal and equitable you want to be. But really what it comes down to is like these person to person interactions. Right. And to make sure that everybody has the the sort of presence and awareness and like sort of self-awareness to to be good to other people and like, you know, no matter what your sort of corporate policy is, if you haven't, you know, trained and supported your people in actually understanding the complexity of the things that you're doing, um, you could, you know, the whole thing can kind of crumble. And yeah. I, and also, Chris, I, like, I really want to hear what you want to say, but yeah. I just want to make sure that I didn't state this, but uh, the, the Portland Art Museum, uh, you know, Native art curator is actually from the Navajo Nation. So this is... Hmm this effort isn't just like, oh, people who really care about Native Americans. No, it's Native Americans themselves who are trying to organize this space that was taken away from them by one single white lady. And that's what I'm outraged about is that. It's not so much everything else. But what were you going to say, Crystal? Yeah. Oh, I, I was just going to say, like, it sort of also resonates with me that, like, people all too often just sort of follow the rules and regulations that have somehow been put in place without having any, without giving like context and using critical thinking when you're like, oh, you know, we say no backpacks, but we see white families with baby carriers in and that's fine. So this indigenous woman with an indigenous baby carrier, that should also be fine, right? Like where's the, the thread of disconnect of using like critical thinking skills because I'm assuming not all baby carriers are banned from Pam, right? Like, well, I don't know. I know they have a firm like no back, nothing in your back policy. So I'm not mm. sure. I think that people are given strollers like to switch out, you mm. know, that kind of stuff. But here's the deal. Crystal, I, I totally see what you're saying. And that happened. That actually happened in the front desk. They're just like, we understand what's happening here and we're going to move on. But what right. didn't happen was when that uh, other staff member they they weren't just like following the rules. As they were following the rules, they were saying the most condescending stuff imaginable. Right. <laughs> like, I don't know how, I feel like Dr. Sophia Weinstein handled it perfectly because what we didn't hear about is how a, a museum staffer was was uh, attacked by a family. You know what I mean? <laughs> right, right. How, yeah, yeah. I don't know yeah. how, if I could have been that graceful <laughs> if someone had like approached a family member of mine and said, all those things. Cool item. Um, you should really watch out for your baby. Um, calm down. Like I, ooh. So yeah. I mean, aside from please, everyone go see this exhibit. Uh, just a hand, uh, like a, just an apl applause for Dr. Weinstein for being so level-headed. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> I would have. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I would have mm -hmm. burned that place down. <laughs> like, <laughs> P.S. Go see the show. <laughs> yeah. P.S. Please go see the show. <laughs> I mean, and I will say I've sort of ambiently been interested in going to the show, but after this discussion, I think I am going to go and check it out and support mm -hmm. it. So, yeah, just so maybe, maybe I'll see you there, yeah. podcast listener. <laughs> what was that, Crystal? Oh, <laughs> you said wear a backpack. I was laughing at that. <laughs> John was, like, was trying to, 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 to do something sincere. heartfelt and was like, and I'll see you there, podcast listener. And Claudia's like, wear a backpack. <laughs> Claudia lives for the drama. Welcome to our dynamic. <laughs> John trying to be sweet and thoughtful and sincere and me ruin it and just trying to ruin that at every moment. <laughs> I'm here for it. I get to be a spectator eating popcorn for it. <laughs> That's all for today here on CityCast Portland. Our lead producer is John Otariani. Our audio producer is Julia Fiaioni. Our newsletter editor is Rachel Monahan, And our host is me, Claudia Meza. Original music by Jenny Conley and Stephen Drizos. Additional music by Epidemic Sound. 
We also wanted to give a special shout out to Jenny Conley, who just released a beautiful solo album called Tides, Pieces for Accordion and Piano. Now, some of you might know Jenny for her work in The Decemberists. And if you wanted to hear her play her new album, the release show is this Sunday, March 26th at the Old Church in Southwest Portland. So you know those acoustics are going to be amazing. We'll throw a link in our show notes with more details. We'll be back Monday morning with more from around the city. Until then, see you at Slim's. <laughs>